Hey everyone, my name is Rayleigh, and today we're going to talk about how to build a home studio. The first thing that every home studio needs is a computer. The brains of the operation. It's important to check your computer specs just to make sure that whatever software you're downloading is compatible to avoid any CPU errors. The second thing that every home studio needs is an interface. And the reason why interfaces are so important is because of A to D conversion. A to D conversion is analog acoustic energy being converted over to digital energy. Basically, it's just giving our signal path ones and zeros binary coding so that way it can be transferred into a computer. So let's jump into some of the basic functions and parameters we're gonna find on an interface. Up here we have our gain knob. We could change through each channel individually. Every channel on an interface is gonna have its own gain knob. Same with our output. We can turn up our monitor speakers that we'll have hooked up, uh, however high or low we want with the output knob. Here we have a couple headphone jacks and this is very common on every interface you're gonna find a headphone output to be able to listen back to playback without hearing your monitors come through. On the back of this interface, we've got one through eight channels back here. Some interfaces will have the inputs on the front. So again, that just depends on what model or what brand you're using. The next step that every home studio needs is a monitoring system. So we talked a little bit about our headphone monitoring system, which is very easy. You just plug in, put your headphones on. But now we're gonna talk about our actual speaker monitoring system for playback. On the back of every interface, you're gonna see TRS balanced outputs. And in order to get our specific TRS balanced outputs to our speakers, we actually need a converter cable. Uh, we've got a TRS on one end, which is a balanced connection to our XLR because we've got XLR inputs on our monitors. One thing to note is that you wanna pay attention to the label on the back. It says left and right. Make sure that your left is going to your left speaker and your right is going to your right. That way, when you're mixing, we got no issues. So let's get in here. Grab our other one. Super easy, fast setup. Bada bing, bada boom. One rule of thumb too that I always say is to just keep the volume knobs at unity. That way, until you test them out and see what's happening, you don't blow a speaker or anything. The next thing that every home studio should have is a DAW or DAW. DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation. And today we're gonna to be using Pro Tools. But there are a lot of other kind of brands out there, uh, such as Ableton Live, Logic Pro, Studio One. It really doesn't matter what DAW you use as long as you've got one that you feel very comfortable and proficient in. So let's jump into it. All right, let's get into Pro Tools. Once Pro Tools launches, it's going to give us a new session dialog box. That's going to give us the ability to relabel our project. And I'm just going to call this how to build a home studio. The next thing you want to check is the bit depth and sample rate. 4824 bit is the industry standard. And of course, you can go higher than that as desired. The location, I'm just going to set to be my desktop so I can easily find my session later. All right, once Pro Tools is fully open, the first thing we're gonna wanna double check is to make sure that under the Setup tab and the Playback Engine, that our interface is talking to Pro Tools properly. Here you can see that it's checked Universal Audio. Depending on the brand of interface that you have, it might be a different name. So just make sure that that's checked and enabled so that way everything is properly routed. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is our MIDI controller. Every home studio should have a MIDI controller in it. This is the MPK Mini. Really great little guy. You can throw it in a briefcase, in a suitcase, and literally compose on the go. MIDI controllers nowadays are actually extremely easy to hook up. Majority of them just need a USB cable plugged in, and then the other side of the USB plugged into our computer. And once you have your Pro Tools or software open, um, an instrument track created and enabled, the second you start hitting these keys, it should automatically trigger. All right, so now that we've got our MIDI connected, we're gonna go ahead and get into how to create it and get it working in Pro Tools. 
So I'm just going to create a new instrument track and I'm going to make sure that it's a stereo instrument track. And we're just going to go down to instrument track. And perfect. We're going to want to make sure that it's record enabled just because once we start playing the MIDI keyboard it's automatically or should automatically detect it. The last step is we're going to want to make sure that we insert an instrument plugin. And I'm just going to throw pigments by Archura on. Sweet. So if we did everything properly, it should just automatically trigger. And there we have it. Next, we're going to talk about how to record and create an audio track within Pro Tools. But first, let's talk about microphones. Microphones are one of the most essential things that a home studio needs or any studio for that matter. And we're gonna talk about a few different types of microphones. The brands will vary. Uh, there are a lot of different brands out there, but let's get into a couple different builds and models that you guys can check out depending on what you're gonna record. The first one being a condenser microphone. Condensers are really great for vocal recordings. Um, they're very warm. Usually you want a solid powerhouse condenser microphone, specifically if you're gonna plan on doing more vocal recordings. The next one is dynamic. And a dynamic microphone is great for instrumentation or instrument miking or any type of direct directional application. The third is a ribbon microphone. And ribbon microphones are very sensitive because of the ribbon that they have built within them. These would be great to put on an acoustic piano, maybe an upright bass, something that has a lot of intricacies dynamically that you want to pick up. One other thing I wanted to mention is 48 Phantom Power, uh, or 48V is what you'll see on the icon, usually on an interface. What 48V is, is an extra added power boost, essentially, that you're sending down your microphone channel. So depending on if you've got a condenser microphone and some dynamic microphones, uh, you might need to actually send Phantom Power. But you'll want to check out the brand and make sure that you're reading through the manual uh, just so you don't blow the microphone out. Because if you send Phantom Power to the wrong microphone, it can ruin it. Now that we have our microphone plugged in, let's go ahead and create our audio track. Command Shift N brings up our mono audio track dialog box. We can click Enter, just create that. We could relabel it quick, call it Vox 1. And we're just going to double check the input to make sure that it's matching our interface. We plug the microphone into channel 1, so we're just going to make sure that's coming in to mic line 1. But as you can see, I'm talking into the microphone right now and it's not showing us any meter. In order to see that, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that we are input enabled. There we go. Now we can see the meter, and if we record enable, we are ready to record. Check one, two. Check one, two. The last thing that we're gonna talk about today is acoustic proofing. Every home studio needs some type of acoustic proofing. You could use wall panels like this to help absorb uh, the sound, or you could also build or buy your own diffusion panel, which breaks up the waves a little bit as well. You could also buy a vocal shield if you're planning on doing more vocal recordings than anything else to help isolate that vocal. A couple other things you could invest in would be some gobos, which are standalone acoustic units that you can wrap around something specific, like a guitar amp, a drummer, a bass amp, anything like that. Uh, and lastly, if you're mixing something with a lot of low-end sub-frequencies like an EDM or hip-hop song, you might want to think about building some bass traps in the back corners of your room. Again, we're just trying to um, have the most articulate reflection of our mix so that way we can avoid misinterpretation. All right, guys, hopefully that helped. Comment below if there's a specific topic in this video you'd like us to go more in-depth about. Smash the like button and subscribe for more production tips. My name's Rayleigh, and peace out.